Welcome to another fireside chat with the experts. Today we're going to have we have Miriam Ortiz, our VP of Manufacturing. It's going to be discussing uh, X-ray system manufacturing and how we make those machines safe for you to use and operate. So, with that, Miriam. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Bill, thank you for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right. There we go. Perfect. Can you guys see my screen? All right. So, um, X-ray machines, we've all heard about radiation. Uh, it sounds like a scary term. It's been around for a really long time, but what does it really mean? And how does that play into cabinet X-ray systems like the ones we built here at X-ray, uh, at Creative Electron? So I'm gonna go over quickly like basics of radiation and uh, how we use the knowledge that we've been able to acquire in the last um, hundred or so years about radiation to make machines safe and what are the things that uh, are part of the culture of industrial x-ray use that allow us to use this technology and you know just reap the benefits from it and really minimize any of the risks that come from using x-rays. So as the most basic um, definition, radiation is just energy in the form of uh, particles or rays. So this makes radiation um, Kind of unique. Uh, it acts like light, so it can have uh, mass or it can just be as a wave, which it, we treat both of them differently when we're talking about radi radiation safety. Um, I'm going to focus, there's many different types of radiation, but for this um, meeting I'm going to focus on four types. Uh, so we're going to start with alpha particles. Alpha particles, as the name implies, uh, are a particle, so they have mass. What does that mean? It means that um, they're actual objects with weight and, and they can't easily just penetrate through solid material. So um, alpha particles are considered the least harmful uh, of the, the ones I'm going to review. Uh, they are really easy to block. You can just, um, even like a sheet of paper is able to block alpha particles. Uh, they won't penetrate through your clothing. They won't penetrate through your skin. Uh, they are dangerous when ingested. Uh, but they're not just, if they're just around, it's not going to harm uh, your body unless you're breathing it in. Uh, one of the uses that we have for alpha particles that we're all going to be familiar with is actually uh, smoke detectors. So a smoke detector has um, a, a radiation um, emitter, like alpha particles on one end, and then it has a sensor on the other end. And in between the two, there's just empty space. Uh, like it's exposed to the room, whatever room it's in, it's in your kitchen or whatever. And uh, just to demonstrate how easily it, you can stop alpha particles, if smoke gets in between the, the emitter and the sensor, that's when your alarm triggers because it detects that something's blocking the alpha particles from reaching the sensor. So that's a really um, simple application. And um, just, you know, typically we don't worry about alpha particles when we're talking about x ray machines. Uh, beta particles we have um, another form of um, particle radiation. Uh, these are about 8,000 times smaller than alpha particles, so they are more uh, likely to penetrate through solids. Um, they can cause like burns on your skin, things like that. Um, but uh, again, relatively easy to block, um, like wood, we'll be able to use wood or like thin sheets of aluminum uh, to block beta particles. Um, so, we, we have these two types of uh, particle radiation that are part of x-rays. Um, I mean, sorry, part of, of the radiation protection program. Um, and beta particles are typically whenever there's, we talk about like Fukushima or disasters that we had where water gets contaminated. Um, we're typically talking about beta particles running you know, in the water. So if you ingest them, they are highly toxic. The other aspect of radiation I was mentioning is the wave uh, behavior. So that's where x-rays come in um, and gamma rays. 
So these are the ones really that we're concerned about because they don't have, because they're a wave, they don't have matter. So they're able to go through solids much more easily. Um, and, you know, they'd be able to like, if, if you were completely exposed to x-rays or gamma rays, they'd be able to just penetrate your body depending on, on the, the power levels that you have. Uh, so they can be considered much more uh, damaging. They'll, they'll cause, you know, depending on, on the exposure, it'll be either like, you know, even death uh, or just more longer term uh, changes like affecting your DNA, cancer, things like that. So this is typically what we think of when we think of radiation. This little um, display here just shows what I was mentioning before. Different types of radiation can be blocked by different sorts of materials. So alpha and beta particles can be blocked by um, just different uh, like a sheet of paper or uh, wood and then uh, x-rays and gamma require like a few feet of concrete or a thick piece of lead uh, materials that are much more dense to be able to stop them uh, from penetrating through. So this is something, this knowledge we've been able to acquire throughout thanks to the experiments that a lot of people did throughout the years. Uh, so this is used in our manufacturing practices. Uh, this allows us to create a safe um, x-ray machine. And we're going to go a little bit more into that later. So uh, one of the early, you know, pioneers for radiation was William Rotgen. Um, he started to experiment with radiation. He almost figured out the particle and wave uh, differences in radiation. Uh, not quite. So he, he, we really attribute a lot of the technology to him. Uh, well, the most basic unit of measuring x-rays is named after him. So Arotgen is just going to talk about the exposure of x-rays and gamma rays in the air. Uh, so it doesn't talk about the particle um, radiation that we were discussing earlier. Um, and But what, one of the things that we're interested in um, we want to know how that radiation is going to affect certain items, right? So we talk about the absorbed dose, radiation absorbed dose. So in, in, this, measure, in this unit of measurement, we take into account the mass of the material uh, to see the effect that it would have on um, the item. Um, most commonly, we're concerned about humans. So then we have the next unit called Rotgen equivalent man. Um, for this one, we're taking into account the biological factors that would, I mean, the biological effects that would come from radiation exposure. Uh, practically, these are, are all interchangeable. So you'll hear people refer to REMS, RADS, uh, back and forth. Uh, Rotgens is not as commonly used, at least um, in the US, it might be in other areas. Uh, but they're all, for practical purposes, they're all um, about the same. So for radiation, uh, you can talk about total exposure, and then you can talk about dose rate. Uh, for safety purposes, we typically refer to a dose rate to create standards. Uh, what does this mean? This means we're talking about the total exposure of radiation in a certain period of time. So in this case, we're talking about millirems per hour. Uh, this is what the FDA uses for their standards. Um, and because it's going to matter how you receive that radiation, right? So if, if you get, let's call it 10 units of radiation in an hour period, and if you get 10 units of radiation over five years, after the five years, both of these people have the same total exposure, but the effects that you're going to see on the body are going to be significantly different depending on that acute exposure of, you know, a lot of a lot of exposure in a short period of time or that more chronic um, exposure. So it, 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 for safety, we want to know um, the radiation compared to a time variable. One of the interesting things with radiation, there's a lot of fear around a topic like this, but really uh, radiation is all around us. We have it in, you know, from the sun, uh, in like just the earth around you, rocks and like construction materials. So just by walking around life doing, you know, just your daily activities, uh, you get about 600 millirems a year. So 
uh, when we talk about industrial use of x-rays, uh, we're going to do like a rough comparison to see um, it really, you're really not getting that much uh, more um, in the worst case scenario. So um, the, just by walking around, there's radiation everywhere. Uh, one of the most common sources of radiation for humans is radon. This is more so an issue in areas of the country that have basements because there is, so radon is a particle uh, type of radiation. Uh, so you, you would ingest it by breathing it. And uh, so basements are just this perfect little chamber where there's no, not a lot of air circulation. Uh, so you're, you, you take in all this radiation and then you start to see some of the effects. Really the exposure, it's about, it accounts for about 40% of a person's total exposure in a year but uh, we're talking about low levels and it's easily addressed just by ventilating your, uh, your basement. So I really like this graphic. Uh, it shows the exposure that a person can receive uh, within a year. And obviously a lot of it is going to depend on your lifestyle. If you're someone that has a heart problem and you need to get a heart stress test done on a regular basis, uh, then this distribution is going to look different. Uh, if you have a lot of like injuries, you, you keep getting like here co computed tomography, this blue section, uh, those are your CT scans. Uh, that exposes you to quite a big amount of radiation. Um, so there is some variation here depending on, on your lifestyle, uh, but most of it comes from just background, right? Most of it just comes from walking around and just living your life like a normal person. Uh, this teeny tiny sliver right below the red, uh, less than 0.1% is for industrial and occupational. So our x-ray ma machines would fall into this category. Um, and there's a few reasons why this piece of the pie is so small. So the first reason for the, the piece of the pie to be so small is there are strict regulations that um, apply to x-ray systems. Here at Creative Electron, we build something what's called, that's called cabinet x-ray systems. Really all that means is that you have your x-ray source inside uh, of a lead box. So yeah, you have your x-ray source, you have your, your sensor, your sample, everything is happening within this lead box. So all of the radiation is contained within it. Uh, so as we discussed earlier, because we know what materials can stop the harmful uh, radiation that we're concerned about much more easily, we use those in our production process. Uh, so your machine, as it leaves our facilities, is already safe to operate. And then in addition to that, the FDA or whatever regulate, uh, safety regulations you have in your country um, has things that need to be followed. So one of these things are the yearly radiation checks. This is why your maintenance is so important. Not only are you cutting down on your, you know, any downtime if, if you don't get your machine serviced, but it's a safety thing, right? You, you want to make sure that nothing has changed, the machine wasn't moved in a way that it's going to affect radiation, that the safety mechanisms are still working. This is gonna be important to be done once a year. Um, and they also talk about, as we were discussing before, uh, for safety, we talk about a dose rate for radiation. Uh, so the FDA specifies uh, less than 0.5 millirads per hour, uh, two inches away from any surface of the machine that you can touch. Um, so this would be, in Europe it's 0.1, but it's at twice the distance. So roughly it ends up being equivalent uh, in, in different countries. It just depends on how, how your, you know, the rules are written out for you. Uh, another safety mechanism that we have on an x-ray machine is an x-ray on light. So this red light that you can see here, tower light, is visible from all um, around the machine. Uh, the purpose of this light is to inform anyone that's in the room that x-rays are being generated. So when the machine is just powered on, this light's going to be off. When you click x-rays on and you start producing radiation, that's when the red light will turn on. As soon as you turn off your x-rays, your light turns off. So this is just to, to have people around be aware. Um, and it, it just increases the, the, you know, the, safety, the safety steps that we can take on using an x-ray machine. Uh, we also have interlocks, uh, depending on the configuration of the machine or whether it has doors, ports, shutters, uh, they all have slight different uh, variations, but there's redundancies. So you have, even for like one door, you'll have two interlocks, 
uh, those interlocks, um, if one of them fails, but the other one's working, you still won't be able to power on your machine. The interlocks don't physically lock the door to your machine, but they, uh, if you were to open the door, for example, during uh, an x-ray inspection, you would automatically cut the current that goes to the x-ray source, which means you won't be able to produce any more radiation. And uh, I, I like to reference, uh, Glenn here says, uh, trying to get that radiation is like trying to beat the light in your refrigerator. We're talking about really, really, really high speeds here. Uh, so by opening the door, you're dis disengaging the interlock and shutting down the x-ray source automatically. Um, we also have an emergency stop and a uh, key. The purpose of the key is to limit access to the machine so that only people that are properly trained to use the machine um, have access to it. So you can remove the key when it's in the off position, but not in the on position. So if we go back to the example of if, if you're using an industrial x-ray machine, uh, you're a full-time worker, you work eight hours a week, uh, five, I'm sorry, eight hours a day, five days a week, um, 52 weeks a year, whatever you want to call it. Um, if you were exposed to your x-ray machine the whole time that you're working, which first of all, that's probably not what's happening, and your x-ray machine is barely passing with the limits of the FDA, the 0.5, uh, you'd be getting about 2,000 millirems a year. So um, <clears throat> that, it, oh, sorry, 1,000, my mistake. So you'd be getting about the same about heart stress test um, and if you remember from previous slides, just by being around, you're getting about 600 uh, millirems a year. So you're really not getting that much more in the worst case scenario of your machine. Um, this is typically not what we see with x-ray machines. Uh, typically, we're looking at uh, levels of 0 0.01 instead of 0 0.5. So um, this is one of the reasons why that piece of the pie for industrial x-rays was so small. Um, and if, if you take a look at this chart, these are a few examples. So if you have a head or a neck x-ray, you're gonna get 20 millirems. Chest x-ray is much lower just because you're going through mostly air in your lungs, right? Uh, so you need less power to be able to see an x-ray image. Um, CT scan, as we mentioned, those give you quite a bit of radiation because you're exposed to um, the x-rays are on around you for a long period of time compared to an x-ray, which is just a single shot very instant. Um, but even like a flight, right? An airplane flight, we're talking about 0.6 millirems per hour of flying. An x-ray machine can't be higher than 0.5. So we don't typically associate flying um, as a source of radiation, but really it tends to contribute more to your radiation pie than just using an x-ray machine for work. So just you know, just to, to, this just brings to light how much misinformation there is about a topic like radiation and how much um, of the information is just driven by fear versus actual facts. So another huge aspect of having um, training with, with x-ray machines is Alara. So Alara is more so uh, way of doing things. It's a, a, a methodology. Um, it's a mindset of using x-ray machines in the safest way possible. Um, Alara stands for as low as reasonably achievable. And it, it just, part of training people on using x-ray machines involves this, right? So what are the things that I can do to mitigate the risks uh, that could potentially come from an x-ray machine? Um, what can I do to make sure that me, as a certified user of the machine and everyone in the room, even the people in, in, that might not be in that same room, just like the room next door in an admin position or whatever, um, what do I have to do to make sure that everyone is safe and this is not a safety hazard for anyone? Um, <clears throat> a few of the key um, concepts for Alara are time, distance, shielding, and collimation. I'm not gonna go into collimation too in depth, but basically collimation is just Reducing, so x-rays come out in the shape of a cone with a collimator, you're reducing the size of your beam so that you're only using what you need. So basically, um, 
your x-ray source might produce a lot more than what you need uh, by just limiting that. Your, that's one of the steps that you're taking uh, with Alara. So Alara is part of the manufacturing process, uh, part of the service process, and a big part of the day-to-day -day use. Uh, so it's part of the, inf of the information that we transfer to the users of our machines so that they can safely operate an x-ray machine. Um, so time, distance, and shielding. Um, time, as we've been discussing, uh, safety for radiation is a unit of radiation over a period of time, right? So this means that the longer I'm exposed to a radiation source, the more um, harmful effects I will have. Uh, so if you're ex if you can limit the, the time that you're exposed to X-ray machines, that's going to significantly impact your um, total overall exposure uh, in a year. So a few of the things that we do is basically just pre-plan your job, know what you need to do. Um, with cabinet x-rays, there's not a whole lot of, um, you know, practicing before doing mock-ups and practice runs. This uh, is more so for highly radioactive areas uh, or different types of industries uh, because as we mentioned with, with the cabinet x-ray, anything that you're experiencing outside of that closed cabinet is so low to begin with. It's just more of a common sense, like just, you know, do, do what you need to do. Don't leave the source on if it doesn't need to be on um, and just limit your, your time as much as possible. One of the features that we have on our TrueView software um, and it allows for minimizing this time, uh, there's a, a built-in timer. Uh, so if your source is left on for longer than 300 seconds, it automatically shuts down. And um, you can also pause your image. So the ideal way of doing an inspection would be to you know, move your sample, position it in the way that you want, uh, get your, your proper power levels and, and, and your exposure and, and all, all the adjustments that you want to make to your image, and then perform the analysis. But the analysis doesn't need to be done with the x-ray source on. So uh, you can shut down your source, you can pause your image and observe the, the um, whatever information you're trying to acquire from your image. Hey, Miriam, yeah. we have yeah. a question here from the audience. Uh, is, the, is the area where the x-ray is installed a radiation controlled area? No. Um, so because of we, we fall into this category of closed cabinet x-rays, that is not one of the requirements that's uh, by the federal government. Some states have different requirements. It's still not considered um, radiation controlled area, but some states require you to post um, that there is an X-ray machine. And we have a follow-up question from the same, uh, uh, from Jim. Do you have, uh, do we have to wear uh, a badge when you operate a cabinet X-ray machine? That's a great question. Um, no, for FDA standards, not for cabinet X-rays. Um, some states, mostly it tends to be an internal policy for a company. But uh, what we've seen with dosimetry badges or, uh, you know, the dosimetry rings, and for people that don't know, dosimetry badges basically are, it's like a little film that you wear um, on your body. Um, and it will start to accumulate this total exposure that we've been talking about. And in a quarterly period, you send these in for review, um, and then you're able to see operator A, operator B, operator C, what their exposure levels have been next to this x-ray machine. There's typically one reference, one that's kept in an office far away so that you know um, it, the, the effects really came from the machine. There's also usually one or a couple posted on the machine itself. Um, but what happens with, with dosimetry badges is there's a lot of room for um, misuse. Anything like forgetting about it, uh, in your, the dashboard of your car, it's going to be exposed to the sun and the heat. That's going to throw off all your measurements. Um, so uh, if you have, for example, like a heart stress test the day before, um, now you're radioactive and you're wearing your badge and you're tweaking with those numbers. Um, but the biggest thing, the biggest reason why um, I don't recommend those is because they're more, you're inspecting these on a quarterly basis, right? So um, if you think about it, the damage has already been done. Uh, so it's much more efficient to train people to properly use the machine and to be, be, be proactive about it, right? So do the inspection at the time that you need to do it. Know 
um, what you need to do when you're in front of, of the machine. Uh, and if you follow these guidelines, then it's really a very safe equipment and the dissimetry badge just adds more complication. So that tends to be more of a, an internal company policy than any sort of requirement. Yeah, does that answer the question? Oh, yes, it did. Thank you. Um, so going back to the LRA concepts, uh, the first one was time. Uh, next one over here, we have distance. So distance is pretty cool. It's not a linear relationship. Uh, if you're close to the x-ray source and then you take a step back, uh, you're going to significantly reduce the exposure uh, that you get. So if you can see here on this yeah, graphic here, uh, just one foot away, you're getting a thousand, two feet away, you're getting 250. So when in doubt, just take a step back. It's gonna make a huge difference for your safety. Um, so if we were dealing with higher levels of radiation, then other policies would be implemented for this. Like when, for example, uh, a hospital worker that's taking an x-ray of your arm, uh, you'll see them, you know, you go in there, they set you up, they are wearing like shielding, and then you, they walk out of the room or they walk behind a wall or something. So they're using that distance um, and then they're using the time as well, right? Because it's just teeny tiny uh, split second that you're being exposed to radiation. Um, so different applications uh, use Alara differently for x-ray cabinets, closed x-ray um, cabinets. Um, all you need to do is, you know, in the case of an emergency, you can take a step back or, you know, you don't need to be as close to the machine uh, if you don't have to. And then the last concept for Alara uh, is the shielding. So uh, again, going back to the closed cabinet x-ray, shielding is part of the cabinet itself. So it's intrinsically built into uh, the manufacturer. Uh, so it's, it's built in the layers of the machine. Uh, so the machine, as it leaves the shop, is already safe, right? So um, there's no need to add, to design a room for it. There's no need to add extra shielding. There's no need for you to be wearing a lead vest or anything while you're using the machine. Um, all of this is just um, some, I mean, it, it can be an internal company policy, but really they're just, uh, it's, it's based on misinformation. Uh, so the, the important thing here is to take the real facts and build a, uh, an effective safety policy around that. Um, a huge thing with the shielding is um, that it can't be modified. So anything that you see on an x-ray machine, a closed cabinet x-ray machine, um, it's there for a reason. So if you think, oh, maybe I'll just, you know, drill a small hole so I can feed in some cables and move my sample as I inspect it, that would look really cool. Absolutely, that's something we can totally do, but please, you know, go through our service department. Um, we'll, you know, come up with a plan so that we can do proper shielding for that. Uh, you can't just modify a cabinet and not expect to see uh, changes in radiation. So, uh, yeah, with the mix of, the, the regulations with the mix of the culture that is part of um, X-ray industrial X-ray use and uh, the mix of the information that we've acquired throughout years of experimenting with X-rays um, and build that into our manufacturing process. Uh, closed cabinet X-rays are really, really safe to use and they end up being less than a plane ride um, in, in your total piece of the pie for a year. So, does anyone have any questions? It is uh, one more question here from the audience. Um, this um, uh, this uh, what is the material used inside uh, X-ray machines for uh, shielding? I think that's the question. Yeah, that's the question. What is the material used for shielding? Lead. Um, that lead's the primary shield for X-ray cabinets. Um, and as we went through a few slides ago. Uh, lead is really effective at stopping, here we go, uh, stopping x-rays and gamma rays, which are the ones that we're concerned about when we're talking about x-ray safety. Um, so there's, you know, there's sheet metal built in and that reduces radiation as well, but the primary uh, shield is made out of lead. But are people exposed to lead on the machine? Uh, no, the way from the manufacturing process, um, you sandwich uh, the lead in between sheet metal. So you're exposed to the powder coat of the sheet metal uh, and then the lead is just built in 
uh, you can't really see it, uh, but it's there to protect you. Cool. Thanks so much, Miriam. Really appreciate the presentation. Uh, and with that, this was another fireside chat with the experts. Uh, please um, uh, come back next week, 10 o'clock Pacific. We have, we're going to have another presentation. And uh, keep watching. These videos are going to be on YouTube soon. So check them out on our website at uh, creativeelection.com. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thank Mary. Play what you want.